data driven intelligence and speed prediction inference. And uh, this was joint work with uh, Rahul Sharma from uh, Stanford University and led by the Professor Tom Mustin. So, um, to begin with, uh, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? Precondition inference is the problem of trying to find a precondition for a code uh, that should satisfy this post condition. So, we want to find a precondition such that the pre code and the post condition that is a, that describes the value of code triple. Now, how do we do this? So, there are many ways of doing this, and uh, static approaches like which is precondition computation, they have some short names which are. Uh, they need the source code to compute the uh, precondition, and if the source code is unavailable, then the approaches cannot give you any precondition. Um, even if the source code is available, then they need uh, the source code to be simple enough that the approach can run on them. For example, if you have loops in the source code, then uh, WB cannot find the weakest precondition unless you give an invariant. And the third thing is the specification that should be simple enough for an automated field improver to actually reason about that. Uh, and because of these uh, short commits, another approach was to uh, guess a precondition or learn a precondition from a set of test executions. So we have a bunch of tests, we run them on a program, and then we infer some likely preconditions. Since we are restricting your tests, we don't have any guarantees beyond these tests, and, but this is uh, a likely precondition. And uh, prior work in this area show that this is promising. We have seen works on uh, specification inference, commutative learning, commutative this specification, and uh, not just uh, specification inference, but this approach also works great for traditional program verification, where you have a specification and you want to show that the program always meets this specification. So you're not just inferring a specification, but now you're trying to match this program with the specification. So. Um, we have seen prior work in this area as well. They use randomized search or decision tree learning to do this. And uh, the problem with the approaches in uh, both these areas, inference and verification, is that uh, uh, they, they need the use, some inputs from the user. And we show that we can address this problem. That's what we do in this paper. They have a common limitation and we try to address it uh, within the problem. But uh, how does uh, data driven data inference work? So, we start with uh, a random set of tests. We run them on the program that we have. And for each output, we check if the output satisfies the post condition that we're interested in. Um, if it does, so let's take an example. Uh, we start with an input 0. We run the program. We, we get the output 1, y equals 1. It does not satisfy the post condition because uh, y is not less than 1, y is uh, sorry, y is greater than 1, and c equals 1. So we put this input in a bad input set. Now we try another input, and uh, for, what, for x equals 2, y happens to be 3, and this is a good input. So we run a bunch of tests, and we partition the input set into good set and bad set of inputs. What we are interested in learning is uh, a precondition, which would be a predicate that can uh, separate these sets. So we, we are interested in a predicate that would be true for all inputs in the good set, and uh, that would be false for all inputs in the bad set. That, so we, have, we would have this predicate and we can run it on the random input and try to, uh, try to guess that okay, this would be a good input or a bad input. So that would be my precondition. Now we do this with the help of this Boolean function learner. So we have a learner which learns the predicate and it would give you, it, we expect it to give us something like this. If 0 uh, less than x less than 5, then your post condition would be satisfied. But uh, Prior approaches, they also require another, another input from the user, which is a set of features. Uh, these features define, because this is a machine learning algorithm, these features, in some sense, define the search space for this learner. What are the strengths and what are the features that I'm dealing with, how do I compose them? So the learner tries to compose these features, and that's how it creates these preconditions. And uh, in prior approaches, user has to provide this feature, uh, which would look, in this case, they would do something like maybe this they would at least have to contain 0 less than x and x less than 5 so that we can compose these two features together and create this precondition using a conjunction. Now, um, the features that prior works assume, they were either fixed features or they assume the fixed structure for the features like uh, something less than something and uh, so on. But the question is how do, how do we know what the features are going to be, what features will be useful for the learner? 
And uh, it turns out this is a hard problem. Like there's no easy way to guess this uh, guess this useful set of features. Uh, to guess the set of features, the user have to have some idea about this code that we're trying to analyze to know what features would be useful for the learner. And uh, the second issue with having a fixed set or fixed structure of features is that uh, your learner cannot go beyond the set of features. So it's restricted to operate using this set of features, and that limits the expressiveness of the learner. It cannot learn anything beyond the set. So our contribution in this paper was uh, we show a new feature generation technique uh, for data driven invariant inference, and we do that using program synthesis. Uh, we do on demand feature learning, and we, we show that uh, we show two uh, use cases of this feature learning technique. The first one is precondition inference, which is how do we infer some likely specification. And uh, we call our tool PI precondition inference engine. Um, and in PI, we, just, we do not assume any fixed set of features, we start with no initial features, an empty set of features, and we do on-demand feature learning automatically. Um, further, because because of this feature, because of the way we learn these features, we can guarantee that uh, the precondition that we learn is always going to be sufficient and necessary up to the set of tests that we have. No prior tools could guarantee that uh, the precondition would be sufficient and necessary up to the set of tests, but our tool can now guarantee this. Of course, we cannot guarantee anything beyond the set of tests. Um, but the second use case that we show is the traditional program verification case where you have a specification and now you want to verify that the program always meets this specification. And again, we uh, we do this by inferring sound loop invariants, and we get the same guarantees here, which is we start with no uh, assumptions about the features and we automatically learn features on demand. Um, our source code benchmarks. Blogs, they're all available on GitHub, my uh, Okay, moving on to the first part of the talk, likely precondition inference. So, um, uh, I'll, talk, I'll talk about how PI does uh, uh, precondition inference by using on-demand feature learning, and uh, I'll explain it with the help of this example, which is substring function. So we take this function from string module in OCaml, and the substring function takes a string, an index i and the length of the substring that I'm interested in. And uh, we, we are testing this function for the post condition no exception, which means uh, when does this function run without showing an exception. And uh, PI automatically gives you this feature without any hints from the user about the structure of the uh, structure of the precondition. It gives you this precondition which is i is not negative, l is not negative, and there is number bound on the i plus uh, i plus l. So how do we do this? Before that, let's see how general data driven in inference will work on this kind of uh, this this setting. So we have the function substring, and uh, we have a bunch of inputs. Let's try the first input, which is pi one minus one. And uh, if we try this input, it throws an exception uh, on the function, the string of substring function. So we highlight it red. We say that this is a bad input, and uh, for, to, compare, to compare with prior works, we assume we have a fixed set of features. Let's see what happens if we assume this fixed set of features. The user has some idea that, okay, maybe the index should be non-negative and the length should be non-negative so that the function doesn't raise an obvious exception. And uh, we assume this fixed set of features. So we try each input on the features that we have, and this input happens to satisfy the first feature but not the second one. So we get this feature vector true false. Um, we try another input, bcd21, and this does not throw an exception for string out sum, uh, and this satisfies both these features. So we do this for the for a set of tests that we have, and the, again, the red ones are the bad inputs, the green ones are the good inputs. And what we are trying to learn is a predicate that will be satisfied by all inputs in the green set and falsified by all inputs in the red set. So for any random input, we can just try the predicate and decide if it's going to be a good input or a bad input. Now, uh, yeah, that is the learning problem. We separate the good and the bad inputs by learning a predicate. But since we have a fixed set of features, this predicate has to operate on this fixed language, which is the set of features that we have. And uh, if you stare at this table, these two rows, uh, they describe the same feature vector, true, true. But for one input in the bad set, it's the red set, and another input in the good set. Now, this is, uh, this is an inconsistency. So we have uh, 
the same feature vector thing to every random variable, and there is no such Boolean formula now that we can learn, which would be true in one case, false in the other case, but with the same set of features that we have. So, in this case, prior work, they would either give up, they would give you no output, they would fail, uh, or they would try to minimize error, just like any other machine learning algorithm. And uh, to minimize error, they might, so they might choose to ignore at least one of these tests in particular, the bad one or the good one. And uh, as an example, this might be something they they should do, which is i is non-negative and l is non-negative, which satisfies both the good input. But this is also satisfied by a bad input, and they would just choose to ignore it. Uh, so this is insufficient. This is uh, this is necessary, but this is insufficient. It does not uh, describe the bad input. So what is the solution? The insight here is that uh, these cases arise because of these conflicts in the in the learning process. So we call these conflicts when we have the same feature vector linked to a good input and a bad input. Um, and the observation here is that we cannot resolve these conflicts having a fixed set of features. So there is no way to resolve these conflicts if you restrict your language to this fixed set of features that we have. Uh, so what we try to do in Pi is add a new feature so that the feature vectors become distinct now and we don't have any conflicts anymore. So uh, the next question is how, how do you how do you infer this new feature? What is the feature that you're interested in? And uh, to, 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 to synthesize this new feature, we first come up with a specification. In this case, the specification is clear because we want the feature vectors to resolve these conflicts so they should be distinct over good and bad inputs. So for all inputs in the back set, we say that this, uh, this feature should be false for all, con all conflicting uh, feature vectors in the back set. And for all conflicting feature vectors in the good set, we say that it should be true. Uh, you can also do it true and false false, doesn't matter. But uh, the point is, we get this clear specification for the new feature that we are interested in. And any feature that meets this specification would be fine, would, would resolve all the conflicts in the data. For example, if we learn this feature, I'll come to how we learn this feature next, but uh, if we are able to learn this feature, which does meet the specification and resolve these conflicts, then any Boolean function learner, a simple function learner, can now learn a Boolean function over this data that we have. And uh, the precondition that we would get is just a consumption of these three because they happen to be true for all good inputs. So we would learn something like i is non-negative, and l is non-negative, and there is an upper bound i, I plus r. So, uh, so learning this new feature which meets the specification resolves our conflict. But the question remains how do we learn this new feature? And in Pi, we, we synthesize this feature assuming a grammar. Uh, but the grammar is pretty much fixed because for most data types we know what kind of operations that we can do. So for integers we know that we can add them, subtract them, multiply them, so on. We can compare integers, we can take length of a string and so on. So, so we know what kind of operations we can do with most variables and data types. So this grammar is pretty much uh, defined. We, it's built into Pi and for all our tests we use the same grammar. But the user can also extend this grammar if he wants to with his own additional operations. Uh, once we have this grammar, we enumerate expressions over this grammar in increasing order of size. And the assumption there is that the smaller expressions tend to be more general than larger ones. So in this case, for example, if I have this specification, I might start with a small thing like i equals 1, but that doesn't mean the specification. Here i is 2, but the feature is uh, 2. So I keep enumerating till I hit this feature, which indeed matches the specification. Um, and once it matches the specification, I said that I'm happy. I have a feature which meets the specification. My conflicts are resolved. So I can continue with the learning process. But it might happen that you learn something like x, uh, x not equals x, y. And uh, that would be false. That, that, that would basically match the specification if you, if you learn this feature x not equals x, y. But that's a specific feature, and if we have a large number of tests, we say that this overfitting will not happen because then uh, to overfit, you need to learn more specific formula like x equals uh, x not equals x y and maybe x not equals something else and so on. So it would be a huge conjunction of facts, uh, which would be larger than something smaller like this. So with a large number of tests, we can avoid overly specific features. To summarize, uh, this is what ideal. Uh, data-driven precondition inference looks like, and Pi approaches the required feature input to the learner as well. 
what we do in Bi is our runner gives a conflict with a synthesizer and the synthesizer replies back with a new feature that can resolve this conflict. So instead of accepting a feature input from the user, we, we have a conversation with the synthesizer and the synthesizer resolves this conflict. Now because of this we can guarantee some nice properties about Pi, the first being uh, sufficiency and necessity. So no prior approach could guarantee sufficiency and, sufficiency and necessity of the precondition over the set of tests that they have for Pi. Since we resolve all conflicts uh, uh, by using synthesis, we can guarantee that any precondition that Pi would give you finally has to be sufficient and necessary over the data that you have, the test, uh, test set. Uh, the second thing is uh, Pi is strongly convergent, which is if there is a precondition which is expressible in the manner that Pi assumes, then Pi will terminate in finite time with, uh, with the precondition. So to give you an idea about the implementation, the tests that we choose are non randomly generated. The Boolean function that we use is uh, an arbitrary function on a casing of learner, and we use the same algorithm as stack learner for Boolean function. And for the synthesizer, we use uh, the Escher tool, which is a program synthesizer for Camel programs. To evaluate Pi, we, we evaluate post conditions for uh, all first order functions in these three widely used Camel modules, this string and MDO3, and the kind of post conditions we were interested in are uh, when do these functions throw exceptions or when do these functions return null values like an empty list, empty string, and so on. Um, and we found that Pi can infer the correct preconditions for 87 out of 101 test cases. Um, by correct, I mean the precondition that we get is a likely precondition, but it matches the library documentation. So the library documentation says exactly what the, what Pi says. And uh, in two cases, in fact, we found a behavior which is found out by Pi, but the library documentation didn't mention that. So the documentation said these two functions do not show any exceptions, but Pi was able to find a case a precondition under which they would throw an exception. Um, and for the cases where we fail, Pi fails, is because of uh, uh, inadequate test coverage. So the tests that we have are not really necessary for the test domain. Um, and lack of quantifier support. So in the gamma that we assume, we do not insert quantifier. So we do not say for all inputs this to that. We just say take length of this input or add this input to some other input and so on. But Still, Pi can infer pretty rich preconditions. Uh, if you look at this function, string dot index from, which takes a string and index i and a character c, it's supposed to give you back a character j, which is beyond i and that c appears in the string s. But this function throws two kinds of exceptions. One is a bad argument, where the arguments are maybe negative and they don't make sense. The second one is a not found exception. Uh, and uh, the precondition that we found was when is was for when, when does this function throw an exception? And the first part describes when does this function throw uh, a bad argument exception. The second part says when does it throw a not found exception. And this precondition uses an interesting combination of uh, string functions let, sub, and has, as it was a non contains a character, uh, and it also uses arithmetic uh, operations and the logical negation. So this is pretty great. Uh, if, if a user had to give this precondition, which was the case with all five works, the user has to provide all features that must appear in the precondition, then the user has to know exactly how this function behaves. How is the user going to know that this is going to be a useful feature? Maybe he can guess this and this, which is about an i, but not the third one. So, um, so this is awesome. Um, <laughs> now coming to the second uh, contribution, uh, program verification. So we have this tool which can give us preconditions, but uh, uh, what else can we do with it? So the second uh, uh, application was program verification where we have a function, we have some spec on the function that with the assumption p, do I always reach the assertion q? And uh, again, we can do this with the uh, weakest precondition computation only if it was that simple. If we have a loop in there, then we need an invariant for uh, the loop. So, so uh, but how do you get this invariant? And to find this invariant, uh, we use inference. And it, so, so we have reduced program verification to an inference problem. Now, where we, if you found if you found a sound loop invariant, then you have verified the program. Uh, and since this is an inference problem, we we try to uh, uh, we try to see if pi could help in here. And so there has been work on data-driven loop invariants before. 
and uh, the prior works they have the same limitation as with the precondition inference tool, which is they either assume a fixed set of features or a fixed input for features. So we saw that we can get rid of these assumptions and we can use Pi to again do on demand automatic feature learning. Um, and our approach using Pi is inspired by the old approach, which uses logical abduction to, to obtain loop invariants. So the assumption here is that if you have uh, a strengthening technique or a precondition, uh, precondition inference technique, then you can use it to obtain loop invariants. So instead of logical abduction, we said, can we do precondition inference here? And uh, it turns out we can. So how do we do this? Let's assume a loop which looks like this. Uh, an invariant for this loop, which is sufficient to verify this loop, should satisfy these three properties, which are uh, the post condition should hold, it should be in that phase, and the pre condition should be satisfied. Now, uh, the first the first condition, we we can pose these first two conditions as synthesis of, or as uh, pre condition inference problems. The second one, the third one is just a check. So the first one, we use it to guess an initial invariant. The way we do that is by saying, Okay, what should be the precondition so that uh, if I assume negation B, I can assert Q. So what should be the additional precondition that if I assume negation B, I can get the Q. And so I and negation B would imply Q, and that is my initial guess for I. This precondition, additional precondition that I need is my initial guess for the ingredient. Now we check if this ingredient is inductive by checking whether or not this whole triple is satisfied. If this is a loop body, this would be a straight line code. If this is not a straight line code, you have less than loops, then we can recursively run this process. But assuming that this is straight line code, we can just call a verify on this to check if the code triple is satisfied. If it is not, then we are asking, what else do I need to assume with the invariant so that the, the old invariant i, the, so the orange one here is the old invariant. To preserve the old invariant after the body of the loop, what else should I assume as my precondition? So we do a precondition query again, precondition inference query, and the thing that we get, we conjoin it with the old invariant, and that is our new guess for the invariant. We do this, uh, we repeat this loop till i becomes uh, inductive, and once we have an inductive invariant, the only thing remains is to check if it is too strong, if it is stronger than the precondition. Well, if it is, then we get a counterexample, because this is an application we can feed it to an SMT solver and generate a counterexample. We get this counterexample, we feed it to the first uh, the first synthesis task, the first precondition inference task as uh, an extra input. So, um, and this would naturally weaken the learning process. We would learn a weaker invariant. Uh, but if this is satisfied, we don't get a counterexample, then we have an eye which is uh, sound and we have verified this code. We have found an invariant for this piece of code. The only thing, uh, that remains is pi does not give you any guarantees. So pi just learns a likely precondition. Uh, so we need some guarantee here that would give us provably sufficient uh, preconditions, not just likely but provably sufficient preconditions. So we build this tool called pi, which uses pi to have additional provably sufficient guarantees of uh, pi. How do we do that? It's it's pretty simple. We can just guess and check. So guess the precondition. And then check with the verifier. If we have a counterexample, example, then we repeat the whole process. So we feed it as a new test, and then guess and check again. So um, this is inspired by CGIS. Uh, assuming that C is loop-free code, as we saw before, we, the verifier can actually check this precondition for sufficiency. Um, okay. Finally, we have evaluated our loop invariant inference engine on benchmarks from prior static and data driven approaches. Ola, ICP, and randomized search. And as you can see, we pass most of these benchmarks uh, from the prior tools. But we make uh, different assumptions. So, uh, Ola is a static approach. They can only handle QDs that support point of -like elimination. ISDP requires a fixed template for features. And because they use uh, implication context examples, they need a specialized learner. Uh, for randomized search, they assume a fixed set of features and a fixed structure for invariants. Pi makes no such assumption. Um, just to recap uh, the comparison with related works, we saw two works uh, in uh, likely precondition inference, and both of them are fixed set of features, and they cannot guarantee sufficiency and necessity of the precondition that they learn. And in case of loop invariant uh, inference, data driven style, we saw two approaches which assume a fixed set of features or a fixed template for features. 
and five is not making any such assumption. Uh, to conclude, we have a new way to generate uh, features without having any assumption on the structure. We can learn features from examiner, and that enables us to infer likely, uh, likely preconditions which are necessary and sufficient over the set of tests that we have. Second, secondly, we also show that we can use this feature learning technique to verify programs given a specification by learning a sound loop invariant inference, uh, so sound loop invariant, <laughs> and uh, that's it. Since we're running late, we only have time for one or two questions. And if you have any questions, please uh, come up to the mic. So one of the interesting things about preconditioned inference is that you may not want the weakest way. Uh, you may want something which is uh, natural and covers most inputs, but not every every possible input that doesn't need to be there. You can imagine overflow examples where there'll be lots of examples where it will work, but you really don't want it. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so I wondered whether you had any such things, and you know, then the learner cannot is not. Uh, can, can uh, mark some of the positive examples as negative as well? Right, so, we, uh, we do not do that currently. We, we try to cover all the good inputs, all the bad inputs. I understand, but did you find any examples where you, it gave weird preconditions? Um, for the library functions, it gave us, so we were trying to match correctness with the documentation, so it gave us exactly what we expected. But uh, um, is your question about whether or not it gives you simpler preconditions? Or? I thought for numerical ones, it will give you strange ones. Yeah, I'm not so sure. We haven't encountered any of this paper. So, how did you obtain the tests for your evaluation for Pi? For Pi, we do uh, random generation. We use the library of Yama called PicCheck. So, uh, we generate random tests. So, just looking at the data types of the So, typically, how many tests were needed for you to evaluate the results that you had? Right. So, um, I didn't mention that. I guess you have on the first. So we, for Pi, we used uh, 6400 tests for each, uh, each post condition. For each inference problem, we used 6400 tests. Okay, let's thank the speaker.